And you're welcome back to Morning Express. Now to continue discussions surrounding developing issues in the country, the lead up to the Edo gubernatorial polls amongst many issues. But first, let's take a look at a story springing up from Zamfara State, where the state governor has accused the Minister of State for Defense, uh, Bello Matawale, of his involvement in banditry, also accusing the former governor of Zamfara State uh, of looting the state's treasury far above the 70 billion naira EFCC charged him for. This is what many describe as a can of worms, while others are siding with the governor. Some other people are saying he should focus more on issues concerning his state and leave the minister to work. We're being joined now by Honorable Cletus Obun, who is a media expert an economist and a sp uh, public affairs commentator who is a regular on the program as well. Hello, good morning, Honorable. You're welcome. Good morning and thanks for having me. It's always, it's always a pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks a great day. Now, issues of the anti-corruption fight have been largely a melodramatic one in terms of the phrase used by some media publications this morning. We earlier talked about the ex kogi governor. Now we're looking at the situation in Zamfara State. A lot of persons say that uh, it is largely more political than it is indeed a fight against corruption. What do you make of this allegations as leveled by a successor against his predecessor, as we've seen reported in the news this morning? Well, uh, let me say that the Zamfara case, especially uh, the angle and tangent from which uh, the governor is coming from, looks to me, first of all, like a school debate. And uh, it's a... Uh, You've been, he's been on this in the past uh, 72 hours, from station to station, trying to brandish and uh, tar the image of the sitting minister, who is in, responsible for our security, a very serious turning matter of national interest, yes. and distracting him. And his state is a flashpoint. If we take statistics, he has no business even discussing fraud. He has every reason not to complain. Throughout the tenor of Matawale. Matawale, the entire amount for four years that he stayed in office was $246 billion. That's what he got, including local government allocations. $246 billion yes. in four years. This governor sitting here between May 2023 and 2024, it is on your phone, and National Bureau for Statistics will, will show you he has got a hundred and forty billion in twelve months. What does that tell you? That what the governor got for four years, what Montawale got for four years, he's getting more than fifty-seven percent of it in, in twelve just, months. In just twelve months. While the monthly allocation was never beyond three point five billion a month, this governor has got the least he has got is seven point one billion a month. Matawale left a wage bill, I mean, a month, uh, a deficit of three months' salaries, which he is crying about. At 3.5 billion, each monthly salary was 1.8 billion in Zamfara State in, within the four years of Matawale. Today, that wage bill is the same because most of the workers he claimed are goes to workers have been reduced. So the wage bill has been reduced from 1.8 billion to less than 1.5 billion, 1 .5. and with a 7.1 billion average monthly income from Revenue Models and Fiscal Commission, he came back and took away the three months without even paying the, the political appointees who left office because their, their salary was also included in the three months that were being owed. He paid only the civil servants and never paid the political appointees. So what he's claiming there does not even exist. The statistics show yeah, that. Yet he has not accounted for the money. But the, some point. Yes, the 140 billion has not been even been accounted for. Today in Zamfara, kidnappings and abductions take place in the center of Gutom. Which was before now never. His own younger brother was abducted and 50 million demanded four months before Matawale became governor. He came into office, negotiated, and brought back the younger brother. Today he's talking about he's not negotiating. How can you be somersaulting with logic? You claim that you don't want to negotiate, but the chief negotiator will ban it. The chief negotiator will ban it. Is your present uh, DG of 
of, 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 of security, of security. Whereas the former IG of police who was acting in that position, you removed him. And you say you are not ready to negotiate and you are keeping the chief negotiator of Wood Bandit as your chief security That's advisor. That's a contradicted action. Yes. So when you talk in that manner in the public space, you must have to cross-check your facts. These are some of the some of the, the logical somersaults that the governor shouldn't be engaged and indulged in. If you have a flashpoint of a state like this, what you should be doing is concentrating and cooperating and collaborating with the security apparatus that is controlled by the Minister of State and Minister, Minister of uh, Defense and the Minister of State Defense, who luckily is your predecessor. That should be a collaborative effort and not to get into the politics of trying to do uh, damage and image control, misinform and disinform and distort information with such blatant falsehood and parading facts and figures that don't add up when the statistics are there for everybody to see from the records available. Now, now, now what, what rift do you think that the current governor probably has with his predecessor, someone whom the entire country knows is on his toes. He's currently in Sokoto with the with the uh, military chiefs to ensure that, under the directive of the president, to ensure that they bring an end to the banditry and insecurity in the northwest. Yet a governor whom Matawale is fighting for in his state is also fighting against the minister. This is the contradiction I'm talking about. Matau, I mean, um, Dauda is nothing but a bundle of contradictions. He is too, too excited, like a child looking for biscuits on a table, on a dining table. He just cannot believe that he's a governor. Because this was a person, if you remember, who was being indicted with the Disney loot and money laundering. He was on the run. How he became a governor is something that he is still celebrating. And rather than concentrate on how to get the security matter out of the way, he's too excited and dancing around the streets of Zamfara and jumping from station to station as if he is on a, 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 a show, a circus show. What kind of circus show is that from a governor? The art of governance is a very serious business, especially in an era of insecurity, especially in his state. The rise that the last administration wanted to use Zamfara as an example has all gone down because of insecurity and banditry in his area. And with the present minister of state, who was his president, was sitting in the northwest. He has moved like, it's like moving the theater, the war theater, to the northwest and sitting in Sokoto to control security there. And you can see presently, I just got reports this morning, from Zamfara, from KB, and from Sokoto, that the Air Force is bombarding locations of bandits on a daily basis with the supervision of the Minister of State, who is from that area, because the Minister of Defense himself is also from the area and had deployed him to go there and help out. And the man is there doing his job and making sure that these people are taken out. And you can see the decimation of the bandits and the insurgents all over the place. The military is doing its work both aerially and on the ground. And the ground forces are on, the aerial forces are coming on with the Air Force, and then they are now getting down. There's clinical coordination by the Minister of State Matawale, and the only thing you can do to him is to distract him with his so, own. I've told you this. The total amount Matawale got as governor for eight, four years is 246 billion. I am saying to you that in 12 months, the present governor has gotten 140 billion. He has not even been able to pay the political appointees for the three months that Matawale was, with 3.5 billion as the highest ever he got in any month. He was able to pay an O only for three months. He was able to again do other projects. But when you now say he's owing 70 billion, what you are saying, with 205 billion, you are saying that he's taking over one third of that money. Because if you take 70 billion by four years, is less than 70 billion. That means you're telling that he took one. That means you couldn't even have paid for one month's salary if he took 70 billion from 246 billion. If he takes 70, he means he didn't do anything at all, couldn't have even been able to pay salaries. So, what are you discussing? Are you now the prosecutor, the accuser, the prosecutor, and the judge? And passing judgment on the man, you have already brought him before the law enforcement agencies, the EFCC and others. He has no immunity. So he's under investigation. It's not your duty to go from. Don't you even have commissioners? Is he so idle? Is it such an idle government? In the place of the commissioner of the information. The commissioner of information to say, in any case, why should a state be announced? Is it EFC that should be saying this? Is the person we are prosecuting. It should even be the place of the governor doing that. That means it is very vindictive. 
It is insidious, it is childish, it is completely out of place for a sitting governor to take his time and leave Zamfara to come into Abuja and be jumping from station to station just to blackmail and undermine and do damage on his predecessor, who is sitting in office as minister, helping him out to bring down insurgency and banditry that is disrupting his own state. Zamfara has been in the news for the bad reasons, especially in terms of banditry, and the entire country is focusing on Zamfara. And that Zamfara man is dancing circus shows from station to station rather than concentrating on how to cooperate with the, 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 the substantive uh, ministers and the minister of state to be able to get, to, to, to get security fixed in his state. Because today in the entire country, security is number one on the list of every state. And Zamfara is worst hit. So we expect that, that governor to be more circumspect, to be more urbane, to be more civil, and to be more concentrated on what she should do to bring about peace in his state. And as I talk to you, like I'm talking to you now, I'm telling you that it is getting worse and worse on a daily basis in Zamfara. So if a man who sits as governor and the chief security officer is dancing around the place rather than concentrate on that, and even with the man who is supposed to be helping him, then this is dangerous for our country, and some who are undeserving of anything that has to do with governance. Now let's so look at the position of the Conference of Nigerian Political Parties, CNPP. They have looked at it from the angle of the EFCC. They say it is the fault of the EFCC that has allowed for cases involving graft to be made a media trial and melodramatic. Do you think that the EFCC in handling such cases, many would say against uh, high-level individuals who once enjoyed immunity, still in some cases enjoy immunity, should have invited the courts so that any comments made in such regards might also be liable for contempt against an issue brought before a competent court of law. Do you think the EFCC could have handled this matter even better to forestall some of these theatrics we're seeing as entertained by the media? Let me tell you, after what I saw happen in the last 24 hours with the former Kogu state governor, EFCC has to sit up and there has to be a shake-up in that sector. EFCC is such a very serious, high-profile, anti-graft agency that shouldn't be engaged. We should see results. We shouldn't even hear them. Because you make people even get ready for you with these theatricals. This is physical drama of the tragic tradition. We are now beginning to make it melodramatic. It's becoming a joke, a circus show. We are getting ourselves into very bad situations in which people now use EFCC to dance around and think that they can use it against their opponents. This is very wrong. The case of Yaya Bello is one of such very tragic things that has happened to us in recent times. A man walks into your office and you say he came with the governor. You said any Nigerian. You didn't say governors are excluded. Who you didn't say governors are excluded. Who has any information that can lead to the arrest? Yet he walks in there and you... And the man it. comes in and says, the person he came with is a sitting governor and therefore it is not part of your protocol. Assuming that you went on the street, one of your operatives were walking on the street and saw him and saw Yaya Bello sitting with the IG of police. What will you say? What will you do? You see him in the market stopping to buy oranges. What are you going to do? You look around and say it's a marketplace. It's against your protocol to arrest in the market. So are there definitions of where... We saw... This is completely, completely, completely a dump way of acting. Now, 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 now earlier, Honorable, earlier we were, we were speaking here on the program and uh, the question was raised as to why the current governor in uh, Kogi State, Ododo, is sort of shielding Yaya Bello, almost like an extension of his own immunity to the former governor who no longer enjoys immunity as he is out of office. And why is he being allowed to do this? Now, let me tell you this. By our laws, by our own laws, the Constitution and all extant statutes that deal with crime and criminal justice administration in Nigeria, it is, there is nothing absolutely wrong. Indeed, if you remember, Obiano, they, they, were, they were marking him and taking down what he was doing. Immediately he finished and lost immunity. He was taken in. He came, he explained himself, got to the legal processes, Today he is on trial. Ibori took more than five, seven years to get convicted. He escaped conviction in Nigeria, got it in, in Britain. Same also with uh, 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 the Ekwere Madu 
and all that. In Nigeria, we've seen uh, Oju Zokalo. Oju Zokalo yeah. We've seen uh, 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 Jolly Nyame. We've seen several others like that, former governors who were tried and put in detention even when they later on uh, got uh, amnesty to get out of the place. But they were convicted. They are ex-convicts. They may have been having the waivers, but the law is there and the records and, and are most there. of them didn't have this melodrama with the ESC. Yes, they didn't. We only saw the result. So we must see a more mature way of handling these things. And the case of Bello is even more telling. You are now claiming that he came with the governor. The governor said, the person you are looking for, I've got him. All. Here he is. If he came with him to hand over to you, ah, Mr. Governor, thank you very much. Wait for him here if you want to. Otherwise, you can go. We'll take him in and we'll have to interrogate him. It may take a long time. If the man says, I don't mind, let me wait. And he waits. And you come back and say, from the interrogation, we can't finish today. We are going to keep him. Please, you can go. Will the governor at that point say, no, I must go with the person I brought? He's no longer his property. He came to hand him over, as you requested, every Nigerian. If you had put a bounty on him, you would have paid it to Yayabelo. I mean, uh, to, to, to Ododo. Ododo. Yes. If you had put a bounty on him, he would have collected it. Because anybody who can bring him, and he brought and him. He's a, Nigerian, have to thank uh, him. he's a Nigerian And the man governor. said, yes, he's a Nigerian governor, and he brought him. He could have been anybody. He could have been a farmer who said, I found him in my farm. He could have been a mechanic and say he came to a mechanic workshop. Please come here and take him. So having done that, and then he walks up to you, you are not telling people later on that they should not bother themselves again bringing such people to you. That's what they are telling you. It's a bad story to tell, and I think it leaves a sad taste in the mouth for on the part of EFCC. This media trial, before today, we had already questioned it. And today the media must have to go out and ask the, the chairman why he thinks that the only way in which he can show that he's working is to arrest people rather than get from them. Because somebody had made the point, and I agree with them, that the intentment of EFCC is to recover and punish those who engage in financial crimes. In fact, the title of the EFCC has even become, for me, more curious. Hear the name of the economy and financial crimes. That is, they are promoting economy and financial crimes. <laughs> it should well, be well, anti-economic well, financial and... Uh, Financial crimes. crimes Commission. Crimes Commission. Anti. It shouldn't be economic and financial crime commission. Well, well, Is well it it's, it's, it's known on, unofficially as Nigeria's anti graft and anti corruption. It should even be in the term. I'm sure that is why they're acting this drama. The nomenclature needs to change because there's something in the name in Africa. You can say mm -hmm. in Europe that what's the name? A rose called by this will it change? Yes, in, uh, in Nigeria it changes. Because it's the circumstances under the birth of, that the ch child is given birth to, that the name is given. To show what uh, it tells the story about that family. So when you get that, or what you expect, it's a, a hope, expectation, or events. That's what gives birth to a name in Africa, on all African languages. That is our tradition. So you cannot give a name and say the, this one is Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. So it, it can be Promotion of Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. If it is anti, let it be so defined. Now, before we cross over to the Edo, build up to the Edo elections for tomorrow, the last question concerning the situation is what has been considered as a clash between sister agencies. I don't know if you're previous to the video going rounds emanating from the Kogi Governor's Lodge in Asokoro here in Abuja about uh, quite the sporadic shooting at some point, dispersal of tear gas involving the same matter. Do you think that the sister agencies could have better handled the situation? Clearly, this is what I'm saying. It's part of the melodrama I'm talking about. That in getting to Kogi governor house, first of all, they violated the privacy of the governor. Who willingly brought somebody to you? They were unfair to him and he's completely a gentleman. Ududu should be commended by Nigerians. Because what happened there, there would have been dead bodies in that place. Given any other, some of the governors I know in this country. If you try that within their premises, those people will all come out there as dead bodies. That is not what we expect from us. Agency to agency, identifying yourselves. You couldn't respect each other and discuss quietly and move away. From the narrative that is taking place, they left after the man had come to the office. They now came there and they now told him, go, we shall invite you. And they were waiting, expecting that even by midnight they would call them. Then the call eventually comes and says, where is your location? And they say, I mean, the governor's lost here. He said, okay. And then they walk into the place and sat to them and discuss and say, we came here. It will not be fair for us to just receive this man like this. Let us act. That is not what they were all acting. Let us arrest him. In order to give a name. To, so to what they were doing. To, to what they are doing. In order to give verb. In other words, they are under a pay, under pay to take the action that must be an arrest. Anything short of an arrest, they won't justify the pay. That is the impression being given. This does not in any way add credibility to the EFCC. 
And I think the Nigerians must have to know this. And that is why even the, uh, the, the governor of, uh, 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 of uh, Zamfara State must be told in plain terms that governance is not a disco show. It's not a disco tech. He should stop those dance steps. They don't give responsibility and don't imbue integrity on the office of governor in Nigeria. You make the entire world to mock Nigeria and begin to question how people like this got into office. You jump from this uh, 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 money laundering case and become governor under circumstances that nobody knows. And being so fortuitous, you will, are not also be, being grateful and being humbled. And you turn around to now start hunt a man who is hunting for criminals to keep your state safe for you. That should be condemned. And that must not be allowed. And the president of Nigeria must call him to order and ask him to go back and sit in Gusau and fix Gusau and make sure that the kidnappings and the banditry that is going on inside Gusau town, inside the capital, which never happened throughout the four years of Matawale, should not take place anymore. The government has to take that warning because this childish behavior must stop. All right, Honorable. Well, that has been quite a very uh, robust discussion surrounding the security situation in Zamfara State and the rift between the Governor, uh, Lawal Doda, and the Minister of State for Defense, Bello Matawale. Honorable also touched on the issue of uh, the case of Yaya Bello and the EFCC. Now, turning our attention to the Edo gubernatorial polls, less than 24 hours uh, to the elections where electorates will hit the polls and exercise their civil franchise. The APC, PDP and the Labour Party, as well as some 14 other candidates are on the starting line. Who will finish the race and who will emerge as the number one citizen of Edo State? This question will be answered at the polls tomorrow. Now, coming back to you, uh, Honorable, the Edo election is quite one that has, that is hugely uh, contested for, and it appears that there is a lot of interest, both internally in the state and externally. We saw that the president is, you know, vying for the candidate of the APC. Former Vice President Atiku Abubakar is throwing his weight behind the People's Democratic Party candidate. And of course, Peter Obi has been quite uh, vocal about uh, Olumide Akwata in the elections. These are all three new political uh, it covers. What do we see happening in Edo tomorrow? Well, uh, Edo is as good as uh, done and dusted. But I can also tell you that it shows the robustness. Uh, if you know the historical antecedents of Edo as Bendel State with Benin, as ancient as the 18th century, 17th century, Benin was already designated a city on the African continent. There is no such other state or vicinity or, uh, uh, or co uh, country home or any uh, uh, urban area, even Lagos that was ever the word city was added to. Two, is that historically too, you will agree, that that is the only place in Nigeria that got its own status and sovereignty by a referendum in 1964, when it became Midwestern Nigeria, being excised from Western Nigeria, with an identity as Bender, which was Benin and Delta which was later separated by the military as Delta State, and living Benin, in those states as what it is from Benin. Bendel, Benin, Delta. That is why it was yes. what it was in the, in, in the days of uh, Ambrose Ali, in the days of Ogbomodia and other such great men who came from that area. So Edo is historical and tomorrow is, history is going to repeat itself. It is three factors coming on board. Performance, signposted by Adam Sushomule. Rebellion, signposted by the PDP in Obaseki. A false declaration of victimhood in 2020. He claimed and climbed back as a victim. Today, he has shown himself as a, big, a victimizer. They do people know better than that. Bringing down every relic and everything that has to do with the tradition of which is in, again goes back to history. If you know the person of Obaseke, Oba Obaseke himself had betrayed Ovarenwe Nobaese, who was exiled to Calabar. And so that history repeated itself when he again attempted to denigrate the office of the Oba. So it is going to be tradition and history coming together tomorrow. Then again, you have the history of equity. 
represented by Osai Bovo Akpata, a Bini son, who by their tradition had agreed that the three senatorial districts must rotate the governorship. That goes against him. As a person, as a candidate, he's strong, he's good enough to go. But on the basis of tradition and history, it will be a disruptive, he will become a disruptive agency in that matrix, in that mix. Therefore, he leaves the battleground in Edo Central, where, of course, you have an Edo, a Benison, as Deputy Dennis Idaosa, as Deputy to Anishan Son, Monday, or whoever. That is the balance that APC brings to the political peace in Edo State. And led by a high profile performing former governor, Adam Soshomole, who is now in the Senate, who has been come a recurrent decimal in the progressive politics, not only of Edo State, but of Nigeria, as president of the Nigerian Labour Congress and national chairman of APC, and now a senator and former governor, highly performing in all strata wherever he has found himself. Robust as he is, Combative as he is, he has added color to Nigerian politics and another chapter in our politics. And coming from a do not, where he has held sway ever since he came into the partisan political scene, and with his son coming back to him in a prodigalized form, I'm talking about Philip Shoaibo, you are going to get tomorrow an encore, a summary, a summation, an arrival of the native son. And APC, all odds favor APC. It might be a narrow win. It may not be the kind of, because the votes are going to be divided. Yes. The movement of labor is quite strong. If you discover the one Edo state, even with a small margin. Yes. So that will give them those votes. But those votes won't be able to cut across all the, the local 18 local governments. Areas. The 18 local governments are 191 polling, I mean, uh, wards of Edo State. That won't be able to, it, it, won't, it, won't, it won't suffice to make a Labour win. They can win in Southern Edo, they can win anything in Northern Edo, and can win very little of Central Edo, where the people will feel that he has come to hijack what rightly belongs to them. So everybody in Edo will definitely be looking at PDP candidate and the APC candidate. The PDP candidate coming with a baggage, coming with a baggage of having sat there to demolish a lot of things that were already traditionally put in place, things that were infrastructurally put in place, the schools going down with so much of a um, memorandum of under understanding that never understood anything about development in a do state infrastructure in a do state, bringing down a library to put a museum. I don't understand. A museum should be part of a library. Because being pictorial, it is only uh, the pictorial form and the, of, of, of the books. So why would you bring down one to establish another when there's enough space to even establish another one? So you, when you have those type of wrong-headed economic policies and actions, you definitely are putting yourself on the reverse gear. And people are going to capitalize on that because they already know. And like I said, having also gone to desecrate the palace of the Oba of Benin, inviting him to court, trying to take their artifacts and make them state-owned as if the state itself does not belong to the people, then clearly you know that you are on a battle, wrong battleground because you are fighting a war of blame. And that Tiku himself coming into a door is a big minus to them because he has become more or less a political liability. And Obaseki himself coming from the tradition that he came from, like I told you, if you know the history of Obarewa Nubaisi, who incidentally was exiled to Kalabama Estate, capital, you would then agree with me that uh, PDP has become a paria, a leprous party for the Edo people, <laughs> and to put them there will be to ask them to do the impossible. Well, Honorable Cletus Obun, we must thank you for taking our viewers down history lane with the antecedents and the indicators of what this three-horse race might pretend tomorrow. But an interesting statement you made, which would look to analyze even deeper, is what you are insinuating would affect the voters' decision tomorrow in terms of the current administration's economic policy beyond the library incidents. The governor of Edo State also did advise through his Commission of Information that resumption for the 2024-2025 season be put on hold, blaming the hike in PMS as the reason for doing so. 
do you think that this was in a bid to probably dent the federal might that will be coming into play and the support of the APC for its candidates in a build up to the election? Mm, I think that again is uh, politics played in bad faith, which has been a trademark of Obaseki because treachery has become a hallmark of his politics. And uh, you know that all traitors, you know how they end, whether it is biblical, whether it is political, you will know that all traitors end in the dungeons of history and become for us relics of how not to play politics. Clearly, to tell us that because, okay, has he stopped going to work because of PMS? Has his children, are his children, are his brothers, are his staff not going to work because of PMS? So you contradict yourself there. If you are saying everything should stop, you say everything in the industry has stopped because of PM, price of PMS. You have not stopped anything. The only thing that has stopped is the, 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 the dates you are giving about. Uh, this, you know, to call attention to PMS price everywhere that everybody knows is the game being played at a NNPC by people like him who have formed the cartel to ensure that uh, the government is embarrassed. Clearly, you should know that there is no economics that can be explained about the NNPC today. But for the economic policies of a do state and the infrastructure development and decay that is taking place there from education to roads, from civil servants to schools to teachers, shutting down of places to the deep sea port, Gele Gele, to the Okpela Road, to the federal roads that were not even ameliorated. Because I know in my state, for example, my governor goes to intervene in federal roads because it is cross civilians that are passing there. There's nobody called federal government in, in Nigeria. It is people from a locality that are passing through a road that federal government makes. So my governor goes out of his way, for example, between the Goja Junction, if you know cross River well, the Goja Junction going to Katsina in Benue State. That place was almost impossible, the junction entering into a Goja town. It was almost impossible. The governor has come there and <laughs> intervened by some filling it and making sure that it is uh, made passable. It's a federal road. The, today, the Ecom Obudu Road is impassable. People now have to go and do 200 kilometers to come to a place of 50 kilometers. That is what's happening to us between Oropang, Bendere, and Batrico down to Obudu. That road is impassable today. The Minister of uh, 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 Works must have to go there and intervene. The governor is now making plans to go and intervene because it is his people that are suffering. Cocoa, bananas, timber are passing through that place. So we have those uh, kind of intervention. But in the case of a dose state, what is Obaseki telling you? What, what, He's what telling you that he can do nothing because it is federal road. Federal government should come and do Auchi, Bini Road. And those kind of discussions are inhuman. They do not show the make of human that the art of governance. Governance at the three tiers are, is a marble cake. It's interwoven. They are interrelated. They are mutually inclusive, not mutually exclusive. So the federal government complements the state government. The state, why is the federal government passing the palliatives through the states? It is because they are closer to the people. Yes. But they carry those things and even mismanage them and don't even want anybody to know that the palliatives are coming from federal government. So they even remove the labels of federal and government re them and rebuck them, them. And then even sell them. Not even giving. They even resell, including fertilizer. Those levels of, those, those levels of debasement of the human person, that level of characterization of people as being very sadistic in their activities and their actions, do not in any way deal with the issue of politics. It's about the inhumanity. Because if you have the make of human, you don't need to be governor to know that you can intervene in the life of your people at a time like this. Well, well, well Honorable, it appears that uh, the, the current governor, Basike, has stepped on a lot of toes ever since assuming office in the state, uh, including that of the of, of uh, current president, Bola Amitinubu, when he dared him and told him that a do state is not Lagos state, which I believe you remember very vividly when he made the statement, a do no be Lagos or something like that. that was in 2020. Th that was in 2020, exactly. Do you think that perhaps people that, or gladiators, political gladiators that Governor Obaseke has stepped on their toes will certainly come back to take a pound of flesh, maybe not from him, but from his candidate? Uh, well, uh, the, the, the two of them have become CMS twins. You can't separate them anymore. He worked with him as economic advisor, and the economy went into a state of comatose. The issue of uh, Political opponents, he has generated enough. 
by acts of treachery, even within his own party, from Wike to even uh, Makinde to others, whatever was agreed upon, he reneged and never agreed with anybody and kept to no agreement. So he's a man who cannot be trusted, whose words cannot be taken to the, any bank, even a community bank. So you do not even go about discussing with Baseki because that would be the promotion of an glorification of an inglorious character who has demonstrated in Nigerian political space that he was an accident. A very bad political accident that happened to Edo people and I'm sure that uh, the man who, only the locks man can unlock what he has locked. Obaseki was brought by Adam Soshomole. So his period of going out has arrived and he will go out with the baggage that he brought and that baggage is his candidate that he brought into Edo State to come and contest with him, to come and uh, take over from him. So clearly there is no way he's going to escape. Don't be Lagos was a mantra that was used to invoke anger. And that anger can only be temporary. It can be sustained in the face of the actions and activities and lack of performance in eight years. So you can't want to repeat that. Nobody wants to recycle uh, 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 lack of performance or underperformance. Nobody would like to do that. And the do people are a very enlightened voting population. The do people are very enlightened population. So they are not like any other place that you can walk into. Of course, Nigerians generally have become too wise to be dealt with in this manner to recycle lies. This recycling of lies has ended and this is, tomorrow will be the telling point. Now very quickly, we have less than a quarter of an hour to go in this discussion. We've talked about the political gladiators. Let's talk about the atmosphere and the voters ahead of the polls tomorrow. First off, Yaga Africa submitted a report that out of 18 local governments, they have identified 8 spots that are potential violence sports in the build-up to the election and many are still blaming it on the peace accord and the approach of the pdp to reneging on signing it do you think that should that peace accord have been signed despite heavy security president as we're seeing that the voters might not be fearing the intimidation that might greet them at the polls tomorrow no the deployment of security has been at its maximum i must commend the nigerian police and security and their sister agencies for what they are deploying in a do state. It means they are learning very fast to police elections. The second thing is that by not signing the peace accord, PDP, led by Obaseki, have signed a violent accord. Because the reverse of a peace accord is a violent accord. It's to say, we don't want peace in this election. That's the meaning of what has happened. So people must be made to account for not signing a peace accord. Because if a man like Abdul Salami, if a man like B Bishop Kuka, respected across the world, will come to ask for an accord to be signed for whatever it is meant to be, and the only sign we would have shown that you want peace as a presiding officer over the state, as chief security officer, and you are leading the way to show that you don't want peace, then the D-Day is waiting for you once you leave office, because anything that happens tomorrow violently, Obaseki should be held responsible. No other person, not even his candidate, himself should be held accountable. Because as chief security officer, he has signed to violence. That he's bound by being as governor that whatever he can do tomorrow should be based on the basis of violence. That is by, by not signing that piece of court. That's what he, he signed means. Into, he means that he has signed for violence. So any violence that takes place tomorrow anywhere should be held accountable. Don't also forget that the policeman was killed Footages showed who was involved. Those people who are shown on those video footages are moving in his convoy and living in government house. And when some of them are arrested, he's the one screaming that they are innocent. He has become a judge. He has tried them. He has investigated them. Police is no longer competent. He is now the IG of police. He is now the DG DSS. He is now the operative. He is now the judge. Obaseki alone presides over all that. But we will not sign a peace accord to guarantee this unless the do security network is allowed to operate, to go on rampage and take everybody on with the AK-47 he has bought. So because the police is putting his foot down to keep to its mission and vision of keeping elections out of non-state actors. Because it's not the first time they are doing that. In the southeast, they did that. In the south-south, they did that. In the general election, they said so. Non-state actors and unofficial security outfits must back down on during elections. Election day. They've done that consistently. Why is it no different? Because they allowed they allow that, he now feels that he has been disarmed. So his pranks and his plans 
have been dislocated. And therefore, the only way he can survive it is to now stand and take the stance of violence. Wait, by, by not signing the peace by accord? By not signing the peace accord. So for me, he has signed the violence accord and the security agencies should watch him very closely and watch those eight points you are talking about, that Yaga Africa. Yaga Africa also should also come out and be telling us the truth and calling names. That this not, this eight points, this is where they are and this is what we discovered. You can't just go on the ground and say you have made a report about a place and will not tell us the, the consequences and the, the people are involved. And tell us the local government. Well, well, well Honorable, you, you earlier mentioned or we spoke about EFCC and how much uh, their powers are dwindling in terms of really, really addressing issues bordering around corruption. And in the news this morning, we saw that they are on the hunt or going after vote buyers ahead of the Edo polls. What do you think that they will perhaps uncover in a situation where Nigerian elections have been characterized by enormous vote buying? Now, you know, um, let me tell you this. No law is perfect. Laws are made, and in those laws, there are provisions for amendments. The laws themselves make provision for how they can be amended even the Nigerian constitution, not to talk about acts of the parliament, either state or national assembly. In all that, you cannot cover the field. It is as situations arise that you keep amending to meet them. That's why the American budget is the most amended in the whole world, in spite of them being the best democracy that you can prescribe and describe. Now, in the case of vote buying, that is the new method the politicians have found when they can no longer rig by writing results because of the use of technology, which is what people don't want. There has been an incremental improvement on our electoral processes, which nobody wants to acknowledge because once you lose election, it means INEC didn't do well. But when you win, INEC is doing very well. You go to court and win, the judiciary is the last hope of the former man. When you don't win, the judiciary is so corrupt. We get all this. And people want to carry that story and Tarnish the entire image of the entire country so that when you go out with the Nigerian passport, you are most ashamed. So what you are talking about vote buying and the EFCC, this is some of the things they shouldn't dramatize. It's something they should do quietly. Frighten to frighten people who are watching you. If you buy votes, we will see you. You don't need to say that. The GSS is there for you. You are not, that's not part of your work. Vote buying is not one of the worst forms of uh, corruption. corruption. It is not. So stop dramatizing when there's an election, one, ele one off election of one state. You start saying, how many people are going to vote? Well, how many voters are in those state? And how many are going to do vote buying? How many people are there to do the vote buying? So that is not part of, our, part of what uh, EFCC should be dramatizing. It was down to the misplaced priority we were talking so about. So INEC, INEC has done its job. EFCC, do your job. Please, people are collecting monies and collecting rights and palliatives and dodging with them and reselling them. That is corruption on its own. We want to see those people quietly being brought to court and jail. We saw how a man rigged the election, a professor in our acquirement. So I never brought him and followed up the trial until they jailed him. He's and still he was in jail. convicted. And yes. he was convicted. That's what you can see. Those are the results we want to see. They're not dramatizing them. At that point, you find uh, Anigini doing his job. You find uh, yeah, Yakubu doing his job because if he didn't support it and say we don't we have a, we make a no case submission, there's nothing a wreck can do in the state. So here we are, institution must be seen to function and not to be shouting and dramatizing on pages of newspaper and television stations. Now let's talk about the electoral umpire INEC and particularly with the off second elections, the antecedent set has been it's been perceived to be largely very credible. The INEC chairman, Professor Yakubu uh, Mahmoud Yakubu, also talked about the fact that the beavers and irevs would be a strong indication of how the votes count tomorrow. Now, I see you smiling already. It's on the perception that voter apathy migrated following the failure to sign a peace accord. But on this promise from INEC and the preparedness with the support of the Nigerian Air Force, it almost feels as though Edo voters have every right to go to the polls tomorrow believing that their votes will count. Do you agree? Yes, clearly, uh, voter apathy has been a function of dysfunctional governance. People question is, I'm going to vote, will my vote count? Now they know their votes will count. Two, when we vote for them, they go there and do their own. They don't care about us. That is what I've done. You cannot cure that by continuously ad advancing the fact and giving the narrative that governance does not exist. You can't cure voter apathy with voter isolation. You don't isolate people and expect them to participate. So when they are taken along with this information of the police, the Air Force, the INEC, uh, IREF, the technology, 
all will function and that they are safe because they are seeing policemen around, they are seeing army people around, they are seeing the soldiers have been to Edo, the, the Air Force have been there, the, in fact, the Chief of Defense Staff was there. That means the entire armed forces is there. And then, of course, INEC has given you a and told you, like you, we all agree, all secondary elections have always been better. What's the reason? Because they, have, they are in control, totally in control. Yes. They do the limited space and limited materials and limited people. So they use their own staff. You don't bring a standard. But when you now start bringing people from the university, coppers and others, you can't control them. That's correct. So it is easy to control INEC staff. And that is why you can see that if it is INEC that was doing it and using their own staff. But since they have now to employ external forces, those ones have no commitment to INEC. Therefore, they take decisions and take actions that are inimical and tend to discredit INEC. We must pity INEC on this core. They, you, they bring us a professor to come and bring results. You go and write results for somebody who paid you. And, and then after the elections, you walk back to your university to teach. Why Jega recommended you? Because you felt the ex highest level of morality, probity, and integrity belongs to the academia. That was why Jega brought in the idea of bringing people from the university. Okay, Which other sector of our community has that, that level of credibility? It's the coppers who are looking for a better future and that those are going to put in government are going to affect their lives. Therefore, they should be able to do the right thing to engage the communities and bring out results that are credible. So in doing that, you now come here and be talking about EFCC dealing with people who are doing vote buying. How do INEC control vote buying? How do EFCC control vote buying? Arresting two or three persons for vote buying or seeing them with cash on the queue and you say they are vote buying. How does that affect the entire result? And how does that affect? So I see they do people coming out tomorrow because they are now more conscious that what Oshimole did for them showed that government can indeed impact on communities. Either from the building of schools that he did, either by reforming the civil service the way he did, by constructing roads that were seen to be almost impossible, up to the point of his own political opponents. Shivanene and others got roads to their communities from Adam Oshimole, whom they didn't want. So in all that, and of course I saw Bermudia before he died, in the first one year in office, I met him there with uh, the late uh, Maitama Sule. Wole Shwenka was also in that first year celebration. I attended, I was the state chairman of ACNN, and we went to that place. And Ogumoda said, we must now move away from partisan politics to governance. Yes. And that party lines must close. He was a PDP chieftain. At the time he came to, to chair the event of the one year anniversary of Adam Oshimole as governor in 2008. I can't forget that. And he made that point. That he is here today to tell Edo people that it is governors they are looking for and that what he's seeing within this one year that they do will get better. And Edo got better. And once he left, rather than continue that, we started seeing more signatures, uh, signatures on papers than signatures on projects. Now, now talking about the beavers and IREF that were in use in the last elections, in the last general elections, mm -hmm. uh, I believe you remember that it was met with uh, quite a bit of uh, distrust as people felt maybe the results could have been electronically manipulated from the back end. And yet again, we are seeing these uh, technologies being deployed in the election that is going to take place tomorrow. How much trust has been rebuilt in the I uh, in the Beavers and IRF since the last elections? Technology keep changing and improving. That is the duty of technicians and technologists. Even the um, results of this world, Facebook, Twitter, and others. In fact, uh, only two days ago, I was discussing with some. Uh, uh, some investors who came in here to say they have a technology they are building in the U.S. that will be Nigerian driven in which you can do both your videos, your WhatsApp and all in one app rather than downloading uh, WhatsApp, by, by loading Facebook, downloading X, you know, that they can do that in just one app. They're about to build that and bring it to Nigeria. Now, when you find that, you now agree. And after the last election and the criticism that followed the technology that was used in that election, INEC has come out to say we are improving on it and the test of it is what we are going to see tomorrow. It is after that that we can now discuss it and see whether what they said is true or not. Today we are sitting here now. If you call me by Zoom, in the process of discussing with me, it goes off. They say, Glaze. Yes. If it happens to INEC, you say they are about to rig it, election. On your phone, you want to do a transfer. You it get fails. me where the thing fails. You say, oh, this network is very bad. 
But once it happens to INEC, the distrust is because you want to rig election. Uh -huh. So once that level of trust deficit exists, to build it is to make people first of all understand what technology is about. Yes. Nothing feels like technology. You buy a brand new car from the shop as you are going home, it knocks engine. You've seen Toyota, we draw up to 4 million vehicles and say one part of it was not partly factory fixed. Factory error. A factory error occurred. Would they also have been doing that to ensure that level of loss as business people? So we must first grant that there are human errors and there are also natural errors that must occur due to climatic conditions, due to technological misconstructions, and due to faults that are beyond the human control. So that is where we are. I think that tomorrow, after tomorrow, we should now sit back and assess, which is what INEC does on a regular basis after every election. It assesses its technology, assesses its own performance, its own staff and all that, and come out. Some staff have been punished for it. You saw what happened in, uh, in the case of uh, Adamawa, yes. elections and all that, declarations yes. and counter declarations. INEC says, oh, this is where we stand on the matter. And it went on smoothly. And nobody has questioned and even given credit to INEC for doing that. So I do think that with time, we should have, we have had good INEC men, staffers, who have performed credibly. I have met them. I've been in opposition for the better part of 22 years. And therefore, I should know how it works. I, I met people like uh, Igini. They have had their cases in different places. And we've had some, uh, one, uh, one of our friends in Sokoto and those other places. They've all come and gone. But there are others who make INEC an ATM machine for themselves. They are also INEC staff. Well, we know uh, them. Well, well Honorable, I, I think uh, this is all time would uh, permit us to discuss on uh, the Edo polls, but I must thank you for always availing yourself whenever we call to have a discussion on the program. Thanks for having me, and may Nigeria be blessed, and may God bless our sovereign motherland. Thank you. Well, thank you too to our viewers for being a part of the show this morning. Let's remind you that tomorrow... Our election studios open at our, our Uyo studios in Aquibum State, where we'll be joining our correspondents in Benin City for an update on situation reports in real time, much like INEC has promised the IREV and Beavers will function tomorrow. So, Edo voters, you have the encouragement to go out and make your votes count.